Hey everybody, this is So Heidi, and you're listening to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. We all know that the fashion industry is brutally competitive and it takes loads of hard work to get ahead. The problem is that everyone's secretive and tight lipped about their ways. After working as a designer and educator for over a decade, I wanted to help break down those barriers and bring you valuable knowledge from industry experts, and this show is exactly where you'll find that. Whether you're trying to break into the fashion world, make yourself more marketable, launch your own label, or become a successful freelancer, we'll help you get ahead in the cutthroat fashion industry. This is episode six of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast, and today I'm chatting with Chris Kidd, founder of StyleCareers.com, the largest fashion-only job listing site. With inside access to fashion industry employers and exposure to job seekers at their career fairs, Chris has learned what works and what doesn't in the job hunting process. Tell a company that you're going to either make them money or save them money within the first few inches of your resume, you have an advantage over other people. We discuss the importance of presenting yourself as a modern candidate, what sectors of the industry are booming, and the most important information to include on your resume. Before we jump into the interview, I want to remind you, you can help the show out and make it easier for others to discover by leaving a rating on iTunes. If you enjoy this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you take 60 seconds to do that. Visit sfdnetwork.com slash review to leave your rating. Thanks for your support and help. To access the show notes for today's episode, visit sfdnetwork.com slash six. Now on to the interview with Chris. All right. So first of all, um, why don't you just start by introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do in the industry? Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Kidd. I'm the owner of StyleCareers.com. Um, Style Careers is actually a family of uh, websites and services, uh, with the premier product being our job board. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar with StyleCareers.com, we're uh, the largest fashion-only job listing site uh, on the planet, right? Maybe the universe. I don't know if I've, you know other universes have <laughs> job boards, but uh, that's us. At one point in time, Women's Wear Daily probably had... I don't know, 13, 14, 15 pages of classified ads every Wednesday. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember that, but uh, um, all those jobs ended up coming to us. Women's Wear Daily just didn't get the uh, um, didn't get the internet early on, so with, we we found that niche. Uh, we also host uh, career fairs in New York and LA. We've hosted a little over 50 events. Our last event was just for designers um, a few weeks ago. Um, at the Penn Plaza Pavilion uh, across from Madison Square Garden. Uh, our next event will be in May. Um, we also have a, um, uh, a portfolio site just for the fashion industry. It's called, it's called styleportfolios.com. Um, similar to like Cora Flot or Behance, but it's just for fashion industry. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, uh, Mayor of the Mall, which is store level fashion jobs. And um, uh, Style Dispatch, which is our kind of our careerist website, uh, our blog uh, for fashion industry professionals. Yeah. And so for everybody listening, I'll put um, I'll put your whole suite of sites in the show notes so everybody can um, kind of click through there. I mean, you guys really own this space. Um, I, I know anyone looking for a job in fashion, you guys are the first place that they go. Um, so thank you for creating this amazing resource for everybody. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about like your original background. So um, you studied textiles at North Carolina State. So it seems like, it, at least at the college level, you were leaning into the fashion industry. Like, How did that all get started? When did you discover the fashion industry and kind of decide that's a direction you wanted to go with your life? Yeah, you know, um, I actually started off uh, as a business major at Texas A&M um, in the uh, late 80s. And uh, I, uh, if I'm being honest, I partied my way right out of school and um, ended up moving to Colorado, growing my hair long and uh, living on my mountain bike for a few years. Um, to pay the bills, I started working in uh, uh, clothing stores, right? I was the... Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, now it's a store that's uh, not around anymore, but it was, you know, it was a fast fashion kind of store. It was called the Merry Go Round, and um, I was the uh, in-house new wave guy. You know, you had to have a new wave guy, you had to have a hip hop guy, you had to have a metal guy. I was the new wave guy that sold all the uh, the clothes to the new wavers, right? I don't know what they call those people now, but uh, um, that's actually how I got my start in the fashion industry, and uh, uh, I moved up with the Merry Go Round, and you know, got to the point where. I either had to become a professional retailer for the rest of my life. This was when I was in my you know early twenties, 
or I needed to go back to college. And I didn't want to throw away the retail experience, so I ended up uh, uh, going to North Carolina State College of Textiles so that I could take my store experience, couple it with um, uh, like an apparel manufacturing or uh, background, and then uh, the, the plan was to eventually start my own label. It didn't work out that way, but I, you know, I guess Style Careers is kind of a label. It's my company, so yeah. um, that's how I got here. And so, um, and, and I pulled this off your LinkedIn, so I, I, I think it's correct, but you, um, for a few years, you worked as, account, as an account executive with a few different brands doing um, PLM, PDM, CAD, and CAM softwares and technology. So first of all, for listeners who don't know what all those abbreviations mean, can you give us a quick overview of that aspect of the industry? Yeah, right out, like when, when I was in school, I was kind of drawn to the technology side of, um, uh, of the fashion industry. And uh, while I was in school, I actually ran the, the, the laser cutters and all the uh, um, pattern making software in our apparel lab. And through that, I made contacts on the tech side of the fashion industry. So right out of school, I got hired uh, by a company called Animated Images. They were, you know, eventually uh, acquired by another, well, anyway, that doesn't matter. The, the big deal is, uh, animated images did PDM software, um, which is product data management. Now that's morphed into PLM, which is product lifecycle management. And it was the very early stages. Um, you know, this is the, the middle to, to late nineties. It was the, the, the early stages of people tracking all of the, the product development and production, um, and specs and costing and all that sort of stuff in one, you know, data center. We weren't even doing it online at the time. It was, you know, more of a client server um, mm -hmm. setup. Um, animated images job turned into a job with Lectra Systems. For those who don't know Lectra Systems, they're either the number one or number two player in uh, pattern making, uh, markers, grading, cutting, uh, a lot of, um, uh, you know, high-end CAD programs. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so then after your experience doing that, you founded Style Careers in 2002. Is that the correct date? It's, 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 it's about then. I actually ended up going to work for another PDM company. Um, and it was, I, I feel terrible saying this, but it was totally a, you know, I just took the job because I needed the work. Yeah. I wasn't passionate about the company. Um, you know, it was a good salary. I was doing what I knew. But, um, you know, in the back of my mind, I was always thinking about, uh, starting my own company, and I actually started Style Careers because I was looking for a job on Women's Wear Daily's website, and they did such a bad job with their job <laughs> listings that I started Style Careers to to kind of solve your own problem in a way. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it was tough because I was I had gotten moved out to St. Louis from New York by Electra Systems to sell CAD CAM manufacturing equipment to all the companies that were just about to go to Mexico because of NAFTA, right? Yeah. So I ended up losing that job. And, um, you know, not being in the city, it's hard to know what was going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. As far as jobs go. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah Style Careers was actually created totally out of need. So, I mean, I can't even imagine the logistics of turning that idea into a reality, but did you just start kind of just, you started the website, you started gathering jobs and putting them up there, and then it grew into this, like, massive thing. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the difficult part in starting a job board is telling somebody, I want to list your jobs but I don't have any candidates yet. Mm -hmm. And then it's very difficult to have tell candidates, hey, we're gonna list all these jobs um, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so so it, was, it, was a, it was a nice little dance. We gave a lot of stuff away free in the beginning. We did a lot of, um, uh, it was very customer service oriented because people, I, I guess 2001, 2002 was actually a recession, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, staffing was down actually. And um, so that added to the level of difficulty. But you know, we, I don't know. It was it was a lot of smiling and dialing <laughs> to get people on the on the on the on the site, and it worked out well for us. I don't think I could cold call now the way I did, you know, fifteen sixteen years ago. But uh, that's how it got started. Yeah. Just, you know, a lot of, you know, <laughs> reaching out and asking. A lot of dialing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so kind of um, shifting gears a little bit, um, I'd li- love to talk a little bit about kind of the industry and, and people actually looking for jobs. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, the industry is shrinking and competition is super, super tough. And I feel like it just keeps getting harder and harder. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, you guys do hold a lot of career fairs to facilitate the hiring process for both parties. And so from your experience at these events, do you notice any trends in terms of what designers are doing to get ahead? Like, is there something designers are doing or they have on their resume or they have in their portfolio that's allowing them to get the job over the other person? Um, You know, know, the, the, the designers that, that we see having an advantage over other designers, um, a lot of it has to do with having a, a, a current up-to-date portfolio uh, and then being able to share that portfolio uh, uh, efficiently. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like people that have, you know, hard copy portfolio and they got to lug it around the city, they're at a disadvantage, right? Mm-hmm. People that don't have an online portfolio, they're at a disadvantage. People that don't have their own websites, they're at a disadvantage. Um, the... You know, the, the way people format, the, you know, the way people search for jobs, the way people, you know, format their resumes, all these things, you know, come into play. Um, you know, I don't know if there's, a, you know, a, so much of it has to do with, you know, seeming current. You know what I mean? That that 40-year-old designer or that, you know, 45, 50-year-old designer, if she comes off in her electronic presence as 45 or 50, she's not going to get a job. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And it's yeah. not about... No, it's not about the avatar that you present. It's, it's you know, you know, if you're using an AOL address, don't even bother applying because <laughs> you look like an old person. You know what I mean? Um, and, and it's sad to say that, oh. you know, you're yes. perceived as being behind the times, right? Yeah. And so, you know, being active and understanding social media and professional social media and being up to date with, you know, the different tech trends – definitely gives designers uh, an advantage. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's just it's something, I mean, I think it can feel really overwhelming to feel like I have to always keep up to speed with technology and everything, but it does, like you said, I mean, I know websites, I, I've heard of this. I, I shouldn't say I know, but that like will not allow you to sign up for their list if you have a Hotmail address. <laughs> so it's really? fun. Yeah, I've heard that that's kind yeah. of turning into a thing. And so it's really, I mean, it's something I hadn't really thought of. Um, but it makes perfect sense. So it's just presenting yourself and showing that like you're keeping up with the space. You have an online presence. Um, you know, you maybe don't have to have Twitter, but like be on LinkedIn. Um, just stay up to date because if you're staying up to date with that, then chances are you're staying up to date with other stuff in the industry. I would imagine that brands maybe make that assumption. No, that, that that's absolutely the case. And, and even if they they're not doing it overtly, they're they're internalizing it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it, and it depends on obviously what you design for. I mean, the the designers at um, Dress Barn are different than the designers at Ellie Tahari, right? Sure. So, um, you know, you have to play to your audience, and you have to play to the, you know, the you know the the customer in a way. You know what I mean? You have to present yourself that you know my customer is going to like this. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You know, you have to be on trend with, you know, the people that are buying your product. Yeah. Or, you know, obviously ahead of the trend. But, uh, um, you know, the, a lot of that comes off in your social media and the way you apply, you know, the way a designer might apply to a job or the way she might format her resume or present her portfolio. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so I'm curious um, in the industry right now, currently, so it's um, March of 2017 when we're doing this recording, um, where do you see the most competition for jobs versus the biggest demand for employment. So like what jobs are a million people lining up to apply for versus what jobs are brands really having a hard time filling? You know, I'm going to answer the second one first. Okay. Um, um, Some of the jobs that are really hard to fill right now are um, account executive positions. That's one of the hardest positions to fill in the country right now. Uh, And it's, it's even tougher if it's, if the companies want sales reps, um, sales reps, you know, that's almost like kind of a, a, a dying art, right? Mm-hmm. People just don't do it anymore. And account executives, um, a big thing that people don't, they don't think about it immediately. But, um, if you start working in the fashion industry, you're pretty much going to work in the fashion industry for the rest of your life, right? Because a lot of the skills 
that are required, they're not as transferable to other industries. Some are, some aren't, but for the most part, you, you start in this industry, you're going to stay in this industry. Um, with the exception of sales, uh, an account executive that sells to Nordstrom and Saks and, you know, they can go sell software or they can go sell uh, real estate or cars or whatever it is. But that number one sales guy at the car lot can't come in and sell apparel because that person doesn't have contacts at Nordstrom or Saks or JCPenney or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when we had the crash in 2009, mm -hmm. salespeople were the first people to get fired, right? It's the easiest labor to trim. And these people left the industry and just haven't come back. Yeah. And so that makes it one of the, the, the toughest positions to fill in the country. Um, other positions that are difficult to fill are, you know, some of the really specialized positions, you know, like a technical designer job, not super hard to fill unless you need somebody that knows full fashioned knitwear. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So then it becomes much more difficult. You know, a colorist isn't that isn't super hard to fill, but, um, you know, if you, the colorist with 10 years experience, there's like 20 of them <laughs> in the whole industry. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So, and then you will get people that have like, um, um, you know, they'll have, you know, they'll say we need a production coordinator um, that speaks Mandarin. You know what I mean? So you start, it, it's interesting. You try to set proper expectations for our job board customers. Okay. Well, how many people are, are going to do production, speak Mandarin, looking for a job, and are willing to work for 25 grand a year, you know, and you start working backwards and there's like eight people in the whole country that want to do this job. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, as far as jobs that people are lining up to do the, the, um, you know, if I was counseling someone younger in the industry, I would have them embrace anything that has to do with e-commerce. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, the, Stores are closing and people are spending more money online. So the the online merchandisers, that's a you know that's a big job for us. Um, anything that has to do with um, you know getting the product on the site and sold through the site is gonna is is in high demand, right? Yeah. Um, from product related positions, um, you know, a few years back it, it was really super hard to find pattern makers so hard that people don't even make their own patterns anymore, or very few people do. You know what I'm saying? Very few companies. Um, there was a premium put on tech design, but there was so, their tech design is even getting farmed offshore, right? Yeah. Um, I think design, there's always gonna be a premium on design and good designers. I think, uh, I think a problem, you know, I don't know how close you guys are to this, but in the industry right now, we're, we've gone through kind of a, uh, a bust, right? Um, so many companies are downsizing right now or are in bankruptcy, laying off people. It's right now in the fashion industry, it reminds me a lot of like 2009, 2010. Yeah, it's a tough space know. right now. It's, it's, it, it, it really living. is. Yeah. It really is. And it's, and it's especially tough for um, older job seekers. Like if you're a designer and you're, late 30s, 40s, early 50s, companies don't want to pay that much anymore, mm -hmm. right? And so it's not just about, you know, people presenting themselves as being on trend and, you know, tech forward and that sort of thing. There are also, you know, a lot of companies are shying away from these people that, you know, because they just assume that they're going to ask for a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's, it's a definitely, definitely a, a, a difficult situation. And, you know, for people looking for a job, they've got to take every advantage that they can. Um, so this, this whole, um, competitive market and like kind of what you touched on of like, okay, this designer who's, let's say she's 45 and she's asking for X salary versus this designer who's 25, who's willing to do it for X divided by, you know, two, 50%. Right. Um, so this kind of leads into the, this, this question I have about what Project Runway has done to the industry. And, and so Project Runway launched in late 2004 and the interest in fashion soared. Like fashion school, um, fashion schools got flooded with applicants and just more and more designers were pumped out every year. And I think that's continued to happen. And so how have you noticed a shift in that market with all this young talent willing to work for 
lower wages because they're just happy to get this job, to work in fashion, to have this like amazing line item on their resume. Um, how have you noticed uh, a shift in the market with, with that happening in the industry? Yeah, you know what, I, and I never even thought about it in those terms, but I can tell you that um, more experienced candidates, it takes a lot longer for them to, to land positions. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, companies are less willing to part with the money and then they can find talent that, you know, let's say a younger designer is as, let's say 80% as effective as the older designer, but she works for half as much, you know, the, the, the money says you, you go with the younger designer, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so the, you know, the, the challenge, um, for, um, you know, more experienced professionals is that they really have to be able to prove their worth and really sell, uh, potential employers on the return on investment that they offer. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, and and we, we preach this a lot to people is, you know, most, you know, this is more, it's more obvious or it's more prevalent with younger designers or younger professionals. Um, but it's always like a, a money equation w with any sort of employment. You know what I mean? Uh, candidates are selling labor and, uh, you know, employers are buying that labor, right? And they want to make a profit on the labor, right? And so the, 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 a lot of the designers, a lot of the professionals that stand out, they uh, it, it's easier for them to sell their return on investment to potential employers. Sure, I'm 50% more expensive than this person, but this is what I bring to the table. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So like, what if you were advising someone, what would be some of the things you could tell them to, um, to help show their ROI, return on investment? Yeah, you know, with, with, with experienced um, uh, job seekers, it's important that they... Um, you know, have either, they, they need to have a modern resume to begin with, right? So rather than having like an objective statement or even a summary of statement, they need to have select accomplishments. And in this, in this, you know, in this first, you know, few inches of your resume, you really need to be able to sell um, your labor. So you have, you know, bullet points with, you know, increase sales by 25%, design mm -hmm. something that, you know, made X amount of dollars, saved X amount of dollars, by instituting new process, whatever it is, you know, like if you can tell a company that you're going to either make them money or save them money within the first few inches of your resume, you have an advantage over other people. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And it, and it is, it's an equation. Like this is how much your labor costs and this is how much I want to make on that labor. So if you can prove that you're going to make, you know, you know, X times your labor, then you have a, a better chance of getting the job. Yeah, it's providing this data-driven content, and it's something that like I talk about a lot with, with other aspects of my businesses and stuff that I do, but it's this whole, it's not just about presenting this beautiful portfolio and all these pretty pictures and all these great designs that you did, but like, what are some of the numbers? Like, show me what maybe you, you um, decrease production costs by 5%, like that adds up to a lot, right? Or you, and, and decrease production time, or you created the style and sales soared. So show those numbers right up front. And that's really tasty for a brand to see that. No, that's, that, I mean, I mean, if it was just about the art, we, uh, you know, we'd just be artists, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, everything's gotta be sellable. Everything's gotta have a, a you know, it's all gotta be monetized. And so if, if, a, if a designer or any sort of, you know, fashion industry professional can, can show how they can make a company money or save a company money, it's huge. Yeah. So um, on, on the topic of like just the tough competition and finding jobs and opportunities, um, obviously there's a lot of opportunity in New York City and L.A. Obviously that's where you guys hold your job fairs. But there's also a lot of competition there. Um, on top of that, there's brands that are located all over the U.S. and internationally and all these, I'm going to use air quotes here, but like all these random locations that, that you sure. never think of. And I hear many designers say things that, oh, I have to live in New York City or I'm afraid to leave New York City that I won't be able to get work elsewhere. Um, do you notice a difference in competition for jobs from, let's say, New York to L.A. versus all these other places? Yeah, no, I mean, it, when in New York and L.A., the employers um, have more power in the negotiating process because there's 10 other people just like you, 
when you apply. You know what I mean? Or 20 other people. Um, the Targets, the the Chicos, the Land's Ends of the world, they they have less in the way of power, right? They have, you know, because they they have to get people to come to their locations and there aren't people willing to come to the location. Yes. And so um, the companies in New York and L.A., um, they can be more selective and they can <laughs> pay less relative salary because, you know, if, if you apply to that job, there might be 20 people just as talented as you that also applied to the job. If you're applying to a job at Land's End, chances are you don't have a lot of competition. And Land's End right? is in Madison, Wisconsin, I believe. Outside of Madison, Abs- like yeah, Dodgeville, Wisconsin. Not even in Madison, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, on the tough part for, you know, a designer is, you know, what if that job doesn't work out and you moved your family to Dodgeville, mm-hmm. right? So now you got to move again to find another job. It's the same way I've got a, co- you know, a, a good customer of ours is Chico's. Great company. You know, you go from New York to Florida, you save 10% just on state income tax, right? But if you if things don't work out, you got no place to go. Yeah. So that's 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 a challenge, you know. There's a few companies in Miami, um, so you can bounce. You know, you've got a couple different options. Um, there are a few places in Dallas, so if you move to Dallas, you've got a few other options, right? Mm-hmm. But um, anymore, everything is New York and L.A. Yeah. San Francisco to an extent, you know what I mean? Yep. We're in the Midwest. St. Louis used to actually be one of the largest apparel, footwear, and millinery hubs in the entire country. Yeah. And now there's nothing. It just died. Just died. As a matter of fact, our office is in an old yarn manufacturing facility. Oh, is it really? That's so fascinating. I bet it's a very cool space. Okay, so you touched on this a little bit, but like as a blanket statement, I mean, you've been doing style careers for 15 years, so that's a very substantial amount of time. You've seen a lot of ups and downs. Um, What have you seen, what are some of the big shifts in the industry and job opportunities um, that you've seen change over the last 15 years with the advent of, let's say, the internet or just various um, places the economy has been in? You know, what are some of the big changes you've seen? Yeah, you know, there's been... um a general, you know, the, the changes are kind of regional, you know what I mean? So for instance, uh, in LA, they still manufacture, but they manufacture less. In New York, they haven't been manufacturing for a really long time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Mega trends, you know, a lot of things are moving towards, I mean, there's so much more emphasis on online uh, marketing and merchandising. It's so much, you know, it's such a big part of, you know, things that are done today that, you know, you know, wasn't even a consideration 10 years ago or hardly a consideration. Um, uh, merchant positions like uh, planners and allocators, you know, five or six years ago, those were premium positions that people had, you know, are having a hard time to fill. Well, now that companies have fewer stores, you need fewer planners <laughs> and allocators, right? Mm-hmm. And so those are less, the, there's less of a premium on, on those types of positions. Um, um you know, there's an emphasis a lot on, you know, tech, tech design still has a large emphasis because everything's being manufactured offshore, right? And so <clears throat> the specs have to be tight, um, but we need fewer tech designers than we did 10 years ago because the technology is better, right? Uh, there's less people chasing data points. Um, you know, that's that's mainly it. There's, there's a lot of interesting things in, as far as ebb and flow goes of the way people apply to jobs. For instance, right now, if you are a designer and you hate your job and you want a new job, you may still be afraid to apply to another job because the job that you have right now is harder to replace than it was five years ago. Does that make sense? So people, even though there are people that want to get out of the jobs that they have, they are less likely to apply to new jobs in fear of somebody that will find out that they're looking for a job. But And the job that they have is more precious to them because it's harder to replace right now. And so um, we actually see applications, total applications, go down when the economy is a little tight, right? Oh, because so they're nervous that if they start applying to other jobs that they're, they might get found out by their employer and then they'll get pushed out and then they won't be able to find something. Am I understanding that right? No, that's, that's exactly right. So let's, okay. say, let's say I work for company A and I'm dying to get out of company A. And 
and but I'm afraid to apply to company B or C because maybe somebody, you know, it's the fashion industry. Everybody knows everybody, everybody, right? Everybody. So, <laughs> so if somebody at company B finds out I was looking for a job, they might tell my employer, company A, and my company company A employer might say, you know what, we don't need your services anymore. Well, the job that I have right now is harder to replace. Yep. So I'm less likely to apply to other jobs. It's it's, it's really. Um, it really hurts when companies post confidential listings because you don't know who that company is, right? And you're and so blindly you're sending your resume out. I'm sorry? You're blindly sending your resume out. You have no That's idea exactly where it's going. Right. It could be the company you're working for. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really could be. And it's hard to explain to employers that that's why that's happening. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, now, the, the on the flip side of that, when the economy's rolling, when there's like, you know, like 2000, like six, seven, we had like, yep. 80% unemployment, we're basically we're at 100% unemployment, we would get more people at our career fairs then than we did, you know, during during the bust because people knew they could replace the job that they have. Yeah. So the people that wanted to climb, they were at the career fairs. They were on the site. They were applying to jobs. That's because, so fascinating. Yeah, it's it's completely opposite of what a lot of people think. Yeah. Right? But it all, it all comes down to what's dear to that person. And, if, you know, if you can't replace your job... You, then you're not going to apply to other jobs. Yeah. So, okay, um, for like a, a really action item question here. If I'm a designer and I work at company A and I'm really unhappy, how could I comfortably go about applying to or exploring jobs at company B and C and, and try to feel confident that my that company A is not going to find out? Can I ask them to not contact my current company or what can I do? Well, you know what? You, before you do, before you even apply, you've got to research the companies, mm -hmm. and it depends on what industry you're in. You know what I mean? So, for instance, um, uh, in like menswear, you know, like say men's sportswear, um, their men's sportswear companies are owned by either really large companies or a lot of disparate individuals. Disparate, you know what I mean? Like, there's not a lot of networks, mm -hmm. right? But if you're tr applying to a children's wear position, about 75% of all the children's wear companies in New York, the owners are related somehow. Mm -hmm. They go to the same church or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like they're all, it's, it's a network. And if you, you know, if you, if you apply to a job at, you know, one of the cousins companies, your employer is going to find out about it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so a lot of the, you know, the first thing you got to do is you got to research the industry, right? Um, the second thing is, you know, you, you are well within your rights to apply to a job and ask that the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the person that you're applying to um, to keep this confidential. Most are going to do it anyway. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but that's and, a, you know, a fair request. Like that comes off. That's as totally a fair request. Okay, that's totally a fair request. Because I, I, I feel like it could come off as like it could come, it could rub them wrong the wrong way, but it, it comes off fair. Well, you know, the, the way to do it is you don't want to, you never want to sound like you have sour grapes. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you hate your job and you're dying to get out of there. You don't tell people you hate your sure. job. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you're looking for new challenges. You're looking to move up. You know, you always put a positive spin on it, even if you hate that place, sure. right? It, or maybe you love the place, but you don't like your direct report, right? You don't say that. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, don't, you, you always want to be positive and, you know, and use positivity to kind of, you know, ask that question, hey, you know, please don't share this with anybody, yeah. you know, I don't want to hurt any feelings, we love everybody that's, you know what I mean, saying you just want to be positive with everything. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Um, so, uh, let's see, I think that wraps up most of the question, uh, most of the specific questions I have are the industry, I have one last question for you, um, is there anything else you'd like to share that I didn't touch on? Um... Let me rephrase you know, that. I, guess, well, you know, I think I did touch on this. I did touch on this, but as, as far, well, no, it, <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm assuming most of your uh, listeners are, are designers or touch design in some way, right? Yeah, more or less. And so, so most of the people that, that are in the audience um, are, they already work in the industry. They're trying to break into the industry. They're trying to launch their own label and it's, yeah, somewhere around design. I mean, a lot of technical okay. designer type of stuff, but um, yep. Yep, I, I think right now the, uh, a big difference in our industry now compared to the way it was, you know, seven eight years ago, is there is not 
a ton of compelling product out there right now, right? So people think that, you know, I'm, I, let's say I design apparel and I compete with other apparel designers. You're not competing with other apparel designers. You're competing with iPhones and Androids. You're competing with Netflix. You're competing with, you know, any, anything else that takes people's um, disposable income, yes. right? And so when you think in terms of what you're designing, I mean, right now there are no power brands, at least to my knowledge, that absolutely everybody's got to have. You know what I mean? So like 2007, everybody had to have a pair of $300 jeans that was made in an artisanal factory in LA. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And there, you know, what is that brand now? Well, Rock and Republic sold at Kohl's, right? Yep. Juicy Couture is, you know, like owned by a brand management company. I think it sold at like all discounters, right? Yep. But in 2007, it was a huge brand and people felt compelled like they had to have these things, right? And so, you know, there are only so many pair, you know, we can only sell so many pairs of tight black pants to women before we're, <laughs> we go out of business, right? There has to be something compelling and I need designers to take risks and to take chances and to make things that are going to compel people, right? To make them want to buy these things. You go to the you go to the mall or you go to a shopping center and everything is very bland right now. And that's partly because we're retailers their business is down, so they don't want to take chances on things. So they buy basically what sold last year. The tried and true. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we've got to get to a point to where the industry has to be shaken up or we're going to be in this funk for a while. And we have to, you know, people need to design things that make kids hold off a year on buying a new iPhone. Right. They need right? this... this apparel item more than they need that iPhone or whatever other or item this it is. Purse or these shoes or yeah. whatever it is. Or, you know what I'm saying? Um, and and, you've, and I mean, people have to get out of their comfort zones. They've got to, you know, there, there really has to be some sort of, um, there's got to be, people have to take chances. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so would some of those chances be, I mean, and, and this could be a whole different topic, so we don't need to go down a rabbit hole on it, but like, um, you know, wearables and the whole tech space. Do you see it kind of in that area or are you just talking about um, general, is it aesthetic, is it function? Like what is it? And and this maybe I'm asking you like predict, but. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 you know what? I, 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 this is just my opinion, right? It's just sure. not, it's just, you need to buy something that, or things need to be designed that, you know, maybe it's something in conjunction with wearables or maybe it's something in conjunction with another trend. You know what I mean? Like where, um, you know, where is that next moment? Like when Mad Men came out, designers started designing differently. And all the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm older. I remember when Out of Africa came out and every store had stuff from Australia in it or whatever the, whatever it was. You know what I mean? Like that was... I don't know how to explain it really. I mean, you think in terms of like, like personally, I don't enjoy the true religion aesthetic, right? True religion jeans. Mm -hmm. But when they came out in 2005 or 2006, it was a big deal and a lot of people had to have it. Maybe not me, you know what I mean? But there was a group of people that had to have it. So it's almost like designers need to really cater to audiences and I don't know. It's, it, it's I a just complex need, We need situation. people to be less bland. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. But those risks are scary to take, and then if, if it fails, then that really hurts. No, it, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. And, you know, it's um, – unfortunately, until I think my – you know, just personally, until we're – until we understand that we're competing with, you know, personal electronics and streaming services and all these different things that aren't, you know – apparel or accessories related, we're, we're going to stay in this funk and the industry is going to continue to contract. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting perspective. And you're the first person I've heard bring that up, but it's a, it's an absolutely valid point. You know, if you're, if you're a 20 something guy, you're, you're, you know, you have a blue hoodie and a white hoodie and a couple <laughs> different t-shirts, right? There's yeah. nothing compelling to make you go out there and buy a different shirt. Another hoodie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it's got to be stuff that people have to have, and they don't know that they need to have these things yet. And so it's, it's a matter of figuring out what is that item? Like, how do you discover what it is? Um, it's a tough question. Yeah, and, and, and you know, buyers don't necessarily want to take chances right now. Mm -hmm. But we need designers to take chances, and then we need buyers to take chances 
on those designers. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Or it's this whole other market of like direct to consumer. So these independent designers kind of starting up something on their own and, you know, skipping the whole, which is obviously has it all of its own challenges um, of, you know, finding your audience and getting people to buy your product and getting them to know your name. Um, but, you know, perhaps that's where it will come out of. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. But we need something to happen. Yeah. Because it's the industry is definitely in a funk. It's stale. Yeah. Interesting. For sure. I love it. Um, okay, so I will end with uh, the question that I ask everybody at the end of the interview. Um, what is one question you always wish people would ask you about working in fashion but don't ever ask you? Um, you know what? I don't, I, don't, I don't feel that I really work in fashion. I know all of my customers are very fashionable companies and all the people that use our site are very fashionable. Um, I really don't have a good answer for you on that one. Okay. Um, That's fair. <laughs> it's a tough question. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, uh, <laughs> we, we, we're, not, we're not the type of company that would ever be involved in like a photo shoot or with models hanging around or any, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? It does, but you're obviously still very engaged with the industry um, and very knowledgeable in the industry as a whole. Um, so perhaps fashion was not the right word, perhaps the industry. Um, but let me rephrase that then. What is one question you always wish people would ask about your, your company that they don't ask or about your, your, your job, your company, your brand? You know, I, I like to look, I like, I wish people would talk about, you know, and we've touched on it and it's why people apply and why they don't apply. And, um, you know, people, I like to talk to people to like to set proper expectations. You know, we'll have people that'll, they want, um, we had a company um, complaining about the applications on an account executive for a luggage company, right? Well, the interesting thing is, you know, I think, well, you know, people are out of work, you know, why don't I, why don't I have, you know, 200 applications? Well, okay, well, how many luggage brands are there? Uh, and then how many of those luggage brands are owned by, you know, um, uh, licensors? Like, so for instance, company A owns brands one, two, and three, mm -hmm. right? So you only need one salesperson for that company and they have like a bunch of different brands. Anyway, when you start working backwards, you know, okay, how many people, how many account executives actually sell luggage, right? And then you go backwards and how many are in this particular part of the country and how many of them, um, you know, sell to these particular outlets, right? So now you're, you're looking at something you think where you should get like 100 applications, there, but there are probably only 20 people that do that, 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 that job in the entire country. And then of those 20 people, how many are looking for a job, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are the kind of things that are kind of interesting to me right now as far as, you know, filling the needs of people because pe uh, a lot of recruiters have a tendency, they, they don't think in terms of the market, if that makes sense, and they don't think in terms of, you know, how many people actually do these positions. Mm-hmm. And so they think, oh, I only got eight applications for this job. Well, there's only, you know, 25 people in the entire country that did that. So really, I got you about 30% of the industry to apply. That's really good. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like going back to the whole numbers thing that we kind of touched on earlier is like this whole backwards analysis of like, um, you know, here's what you got. And then how did you actually get there? And why did you actually get there? And I think the same could be said for the companies and like, why are they not getting that right maybe not the right applicants, but as many applicants as they thought. And then same with the designers who are applying to the jobs. Um, why are they not getting the interview? Why are they not hearing back? And this whole concept of like backwards analysis of, okay, why is this happening? What could I do to maybe change or shift that? So maybe for the companies, it's like, okay, could I widen the um, – pool of people that I'm going to look at. Okay, maybe you don't have to have, have this specific expertise. They'll kind of open that up a little bit. And so then for a designer, um, I'm not sure what that would be, but just like how they can start getting more applicants and or start getting more interviews and analyzing what happened and why it happened. Yeah, you know, on the designer side, you know, rather than, you know, people have a tendency to paint themselves into a box with yeah. like an objective statement or something like that, or, you know, their their summary on their LinkedIn profile is very focused and, it, you know, it keeps them from getting jobs. Does that make sense? Because it's too niche. It's too narrow. Correct. Okay. And, you know, whereas they might, you know, maybe they should, rat, you know, instead 
sell their return on investment as opposed to selling, I do this one thing and I do it really well. Show what results they've gotten. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love, that's a great high note to end on and a great um, tactile strategy that someone could take and run with like right now listening to this interview to help land their next job. I love it. Awesome, Chris. This was so great. Um, you have like five or six sites. I will make sure to put those all in the show notes for everybody listening. Um, and, and that way they can find you and all the great services you offer. Um, thank you so much for your time. It was really great to chat with you. Hey, it was nice talking to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to episode six of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. If you'd like to learn more about any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit the show notes at sfdnetwork.com slash five. And since you made it this far, you must have liked the episode. If you can take 60 seconds to leave your review on iTunes, it helps the show a lot and makes the podcast easier for people to discover. It's super easy to do, and I'd really appreciate it. Visit sfdnetwork.com slash review to leave your rating. Thanks for your support and help.